So for the last four weeks, we've been, you know, working in, in a new structure, right? And the first day of the week, you know, Sunday, is a back to basics day. And we have been focusing on, you know, the right tools and everything that you're going to need. The, how, what to do with live, what that even is, how to mix it, all of the things to get you ready for two days video. Now, that does not mean that it's everything you're ever going to know need to know about cold process, but it's time to show you, you know, the whole shebang. And that's what we're doing today. But I'm going to tell you more about what we're doing today in just a minute. And before I do, I have to say my thing, because it's my thing. Hello, I'm Mrs. Soap and Clay. Let's make stuff. How's it going, Sudzers? Welcome back to the channel. You're at Soap and Clay, where we make all the soapy things. And you are here for day 29 of 365 days of soap, year two. And today, yeah, we're doing another Back to Basics, and we are doing the full process of cold process soap making. Starting out with the lye and the mixing of the oils and the selecting of the oils and the mixing of the colorants and the doing of all of the things. And we're going to talk about the steps, the tools, when to do what, why, and you know, what to do if things go wrong in your soap making, really, because sometimes they do, but you know, this is the full shebang, and I usually don't show you the majority of this. I usually don't do like the lye solution, show you the lye solution, or the mixing of the colors, and so I know that that is a question among soap, new soap makers. Do you like pour out the oils and mix the micas in, or do you extra super fat, all the things. We're going to talk about that in the video, but because I am showing you the full process with a very interesting long pour, the video is long. So we're going to get to it right now. Okay, so today we are making the pride bar, which is a long pour. So first things first, I'm the realist, but also you need to uh, measure out your lie. Now, the proper way to measure out your lie is to measure it out in a separate container from your, you know, water pot thing. Now I use these beakers that are uh, plastic beakers, all of the heat safe, all of the jazz things to measure out my lime. And then you're going to measure out your water in a separate container. Now I use this little guy that I've talked about in a video before, which is a really good stainless steel high heat I think it's called something like I don't know like a milk frother or something and it is great for mixing lime it's heat resistant doesn't go all crazy it can withstand the drastic changes in heat because remember you're measuring in room temperature lye or water rather and then, you know, pouring in your lye and it goes from like, you know, 70 degree water or whatever the water is to like 190 degrees within a couple, you know, within like a minute. So using something for your lye that won't explode or melt, good idea. These beakers actually work really well for that, just for the record. I, I use them for classes all the time. And while the lye is cooling, I then mix up my colorants. And I'm actually going to show you all the ones that I'm using today. So this one, they're all from Mad Micas, I believe. So that was the spicy tomato. And this one is called Koi. I don't know why I didn't show you it. Or maybe it's not called Koi. And this one is something about a raincoat. Why am I not showing it to you? I just, I said I was going to show you all the things and now I'm not gonna do it. 
and this one is called some kind of green. Uh, what what am I doing? Oh, okay, Tahitian teal. Cool, cool, cool. Koi, I was right. Yeah, totally. Bright yellow raincoat. There you go. I went back. And now twilight for the blue. My god. I... Cool. Awesome. And the purple is going to be Harold's purple crayon. And it is time to re-up my colorants. For sure. I have been kicking around the idea of... Oh, and then I'm going to disperse my micas in a tablespoon of grapeseed oil. Now, grapeseed oil is currently in this batch, and so that's cool. So I'm using an oil that's already in the batch to disperse my colors. And so we have six extra tablespoons of oil in here, which will be, I don't know less than two ounces extra super fat in the batch which is totally fine so that takes up my super fat very insignificantly it's not a huge deal now most of the time i do actually pour off from the actual oils but in this particular instance i had already measured out the oils and had put them in the microwave to heat and I wanted to mix up my colorants while it was heating and didn't want to wait that minute that it takes to, to heat. So I use a little bit of extra oil for a super fat and that's totally fine. That's totally fine. A little bit of an extra super fat, it's no big deal. It will all be great. Now after I've mixed up all of my colorants, I measure out my scent. Now this is a blood orange which is delightful and bright and fun. Also mixed with Nature's Garden, Nature's Garden's Coconut Lime Verbana, which is bright and fun and awesome, all the things. And then I'm going to go ahead and measure out my kaolin. Now I put a lot of clay into my soaps. I make clay soaps. Clay is not an additive in my soaps. It's more, it, it changes the bar. So it's not for scent sticking, although, I've heard tell that that's a thing. Oh, I didn't measure my oils out. I didn't do that yet. So I'm pulling from my master batch for this particular guy. And I, I just thought I was lazy and didn't want to wait that minute. Turns out I was lazy and didn't want to wait to weigh this out and then melt it and then do it. So I'm double lazy in that. So measured out my oils, heated them up, they're sitting about 88 degrees. My lie's at 97 degrees. Also, that hole within 10 degrees of soaping, you lie in your water. Yeah, that's all bullshit. That's not necessary. There are so many instances wherein you don't have to do that that I have decided that it's never necessary. It's like a uh, heat transfer method, for example, right? Like you take your very, very hot, just mixed lye solution and pour it over solid oils that are, you know, 76, 70, 70 degree, whatever. Well, that's a difference of 100 degrees. So no, that, that 10 degree difference, not necessary. That's not anything that you should ever freak out about. If you find that your lye water is too cold, but you still need to heat your oils up to some kind of temperature in order to make sure they're all liquid, don't worry about it, don't stress. Now I usually hydrate my clay right before I put it in the batch. And sometimes I account for the extra water in the batch by doing a water discount in the lye, but most of the time I do not because I'm only adding about an ounce or so of water into the batch. And the clay is binding to that. And it's also binding to the water that's in the actual soap because that's what clay does. Not so much, not as much with, you know, kaolin clay, but like definitely like a betonite stuff that takes like, I don't know, like 2.4 times or three times, it's massively more than its weight on in, in water. Yeah, it's, the, the clay is also looking for the water to bind to. So you can mess with your water calculations if you're going to be adding copious amounts of clay, or you cannot. I've done it both ways and both ways work just great. Now I will be actually weighing these out all proper like for the six sections here to make sure that all of my 
well, layers in the, the pride bar are reasonably even. And I'll be working from the bottom up for this bar because I like the red at the top and the purple at the bottom. So the first thing that will go into the mold will be the purple layer. Now usually what I like to do is really get the bottom layer a little bit thicker than just emulsion before putting it into the mold so it will start setting up while I go ahead and section out and color all, well, while I go ahead and color all the other sections so it'll be you know firm enough for me to pour the next layer onto by the time I'm ready you know to do that so that is what is next I'm going to put that purple in and then we're going to color all the rest of the soap portions and continue on with this process okay and on to the pour and in under normal circumstances when I'm doing a layered pour I would actually have probably taken a stick blender to that and really thicken it up a little bit more before moving on to the rest I didn't do it for this one because I was in a hurry and also because I didn't want to get my stick blender dirty again I am definitely one of those people that like the right answer is right in front of me but my lazy wins out and even even though my lazy winning out means that I'm actually going to end up spending more time on something than just walking across the room and like getting a pair of scissors to open a box I end up spending more time destroying the box to get the thing out of it than just getting the scissors to cut the tape same concept absolutely but you know it's okay because there are lots of ways to layer soap now I do like as you notice I am just putting in all of the colors into each of these sections right now and not the scent now just as a general rule I like scenting everything absolutely last that gives me an opportunity to make sure that my colors are exactly where I want them and so if I need to change a color on the fly and add a little bit more or whatever I can but also because you know sometimes a lot of a lot of scents will start thickening up faster I mean all scents in general with the exception of a few they they tend to kind of speed up that saponification even if they said it says that they're not going to just because there's an extra element of weird going on in there so I usually sent all of my all of my portions absolutely last to give me lots of working time the other reason for outside of the wanting to make sure my colors are good is because when I put in the scent for a period of time like around 30 seconds it loosens up the batter beautifully to allow it to pour very nicely out of the container and so that makes me happy really so you see how it's sort of st staying on the top there and it's not really mixing in well but I take the spatula and it loosens up that batter reasonably well so it's still a pourable batter or a in this case I'm pretty sure that I'm probably just going to take the yep I'm going to very carefully take the spatula and lay it on to the top so we don't disturb the under layer too terribly much. Now, since there are six different layers to this bar, you're going to see probably not six different ways to put them into the mold, but multiple ways to put one layer on top of the other throughout this pour. And I didn't do this on purpose. It's just a, uh, this is how this soap sort of progressed with all of this and um, I get bored doing the same thing over and over again and so I, I like to mix it up sometimes I'll pour over a spatula sometimes I'll, whatever you, you'll see it all for sure now I will very carefully take all of the the soap from the the side just scrape it down with the flat side spatula and smooth it out as best as I can across the surface there so it's a reasonably easy layer and then you know move on to the next one now the things that I did not mention but I mentioned that in the you know tools that you need for soap making or whatever throughout all of this you should at the very least be 
gloved up, if not goggled up. Now, I think goggles and eyewear, very, very important thing in soap making. And you know, long sleeves, people have asked me about why I, I never have long sleeves on. I do, but they always get pushed up because I have found that I actually have had more lie burns, like with the soap batter. It's not a lie burn, it's a, it's a soap burn really, because once the lie actually hits the oils, it's wildly less caustic than it was just in its lie in water state. And so it's not a terrible burn, but it does irritate and it doesn't feel great. And I've had more of that when I have long sleeves on and sort of the, the soap batter is getting stuck between my sleeve and my watch or my sleeve and my gloves than just pushing back my sleeves and learning not to splash. And so that's what I do. But the safety piece with all of that, the point is, stay gloved, goggled, all of the jazz for sure. And you know, safety is important, do that thing. And also a question that is thrown around a lot or answers to questions that are, I see some very interesting answers to this question. So people ask what happens when you get a lie burn and it never fails on the forums, there's at least one person, if not multiple people saying, oh yeah, no, I keep vinegar right next to me. And then, you know, luckily 9,000 people jumping in and saying, yeah, yeah, don't put vinegar directly on a lie burn. And so in case you did not know that, don't put vinegar on a lie burn because vinegar works to neutralize the lie. And it does so because of the, the pH difference. And it does so by heating up that lye super fast so it'll burn off. Well, what happens to your skin underneath? It's also getting burned. And so if you get a skin contact with lye and it's like, you know, water phase or, you know, the soap, rinse it off. Go, go rinse it off. Go run it under the water for, you know, X amount of time. Follow package instructions. And then if you're still feeling like maybe there's whatever and you want to put some vinegar on after it's you know been rinsed for a few minutes or whatever, then I guess. Vinegar is great to neutralize any rogue lye or soap batter on your counters. And for that reason, I think that's great. Super do that. But do not keep a thing of vinegar right next to your station as you're soaping, anticipating a lye burn, like a skin burn. Don't do that. Do not put it on your skin. That will burn a lot. It will lead to scarring. It will lead to blistering. It will be not fun. So there's that. All of the safety things. Now, you've noticed throughout all of this, as I'm talking about, you know, safety and all that jazz, all the different ways that I've been putting the next layer on top of, you know, the last. There are lots of ways, ways to do it. You also notice how beautiful this blood orange is in this soap because it's it really does loosen up the batter really nicely to allow me to do all kinds of things with it which is great and this is another way to put a layer on do a wall pour on either side and then sort of fill in the middle but using the colored portion that you've already put in to to pour on top of so except I'm doing it this way instead. Pouring very, very close to the surface is also great for this because the closer to the surface you pour, the less likely it is that you are going to break through the plane and mess up, you know, your layer. So, you know, there's also that. And yeah, no, this is, there are lots and lots of different ways to do layers. I've showed you, I've shown you a whole bunch. Uh, last year I showed you, I think at least three or four. Some of them involve mixing up separate batches for each of the layers, which you can do. Some of them involve like weighing out individual amounts of lye into, you know, oil, which you can do, but also you can do this. And this is for the most part, how I decide to do my layered soap all of the time because it's faster than any other way. Now, in addition to all of the prep work that you would need to do for soap, the other thing you'd need to do that I did not show you is make sure that you have a lined mold. 
I cannot tell you the number of times that I have my soap batter at, emuls at an emulsion, ready to go. And then I look over and I see my unlined soap mold. And I'm like, for crying, what the shit. And then so I have to scramble to line a mold before I can pour. And, you know, I'm a professional soap maker that lines molds all the damn time. And that's still taking three minutes out of my pour. And I'm good at this. So, yeah, that's that's the other thing that you do before you put your lye water into your oils. Make sure your mold is ready to go, be it lined or, you know, the silicone molds are empty, you know, cleaned out and all the jazz before you pour. Now, this will be put in see in the oven for C pop and gel, but not before I write on it. Okay, so you have put your soap batter into the mold. You have put your mold into the oven. You can or cannot do that. I prefer to C pop my soaps. It allows me to cut them faster and, you know, get them out of the mold faster because I always need my molds again. But you don't have to. You can totally just cover it with, you know, some saran wrap or a towel or whatever and just leave it on the table to, you know, set up and do its thing. Just leave it on the counter. You can do that. I prefer to put mine into a mold or into a, an oven and do the C-pop and the gel thing because I really like the colors to get big and beautiful and bright again too. So there's that. But this is the next step in the soap making process. It's the cutting step. Now, I like to cut my bars very soft. So around 12 hours after I pour them. The reason for that is because it allows me to sort of round the edges, sort of bevel the edges with my finger while it's still soft enough to do so. So I don't have to take out my little beveler tool and spend more time on soap. You, you can let it sit for a not insignificant amount of time if you have a well-balanced batch. But, you know, if you're doing like a 100% coconut oil soap, cut it really quickly because it gets hard real fast and it might kill your, your soap cutter. But yeah, and then after that, it's uh, setting it to the side and letting it lose its water weight and weighing it until, you, until it stops losing weight and then you know that it is cured. And that cure time is not four weeks or six weeks or six months. It's until it stops losing water weight. There you go. And there it is, the entire process of making cold process soap and why, and you know, a really cool bar to boot for sure. Yeah, if, if you have any questions when it comes to making cold process soap, I mean, I've done a lot of videos. I have a couple playlists. I have the FAQ list as well as the cold process list, but also, you know, send me a message, send me a DM, whatever, and I can help you work through your stuff too. Also, yes, awesome. If you're interested in, you know, cold process soaps, I have them on the website. And then like 98% of the soaps that are on the website are cold process soaps. So you can go check them out at soapandclay.com. That would be cool. If you're interested in, you know, more soapy knowledge and more chemistry knowledge and more science knowledge and more recipes and fun and the randomness that we get up to on a daily basis, you know, subscribe because we do do this daily and that's awesome. We would love for you to be part of the Sudzer family. For those of you who are a part of the Sudzer family, hi fam. Thanks so much for being here for another round of 365 days of soap. I super appreciate you. I am out of here for the day. I will see you guys all again tomorrow for another round of Soapy Fun. Bye.